Hi everyone, you guys able to hear me okay? Okay, great. All right. Let's go ahead and get started in that case. So first, uh, just a few course logistics notes. Uh, your exam two grades I've posted. Um, I've posted just your overall scores uh, right now. I have your detailed feedback, but I need to um, go through and sort it all out and upload it to Canvas. Um, so I will do that uh, probably this evening and tomorrow. So you'll, you'll have it, uh, your detailed feedback um, by uh, the end of the day on Friday. Uh, but your, your grades are posted. Um, overall, everybody did a great job on exam two. Um, it was really, really impressed and really enjoyed um, a lot of your responses and especially your, your prototypes. Um, so scores were very high, um, which is, is good. Um, really the only um, thing that people lost points for was just not answering a question. Um, so um, I will post the detailed feedback and then if you have any questions about yours, um, just let me know after that. So um, I just realized um, that I did not do the, uh, I said I would post a, an example of uh, example topics for the grad lit review. Um, I will be sure to post that um, by tomorrow evening as well. Um, I wrote it down and then I left the note here. Um, and so I totally forgot about that. So I'm sorry about that and I will get that posted as well. Uh, your checkpoint two has been posted to Canvas, um, and which is due on uh, Monday, November 2nd um, for midnight. Um, and it's just a, a few questions for you to answer about your projects. Oh, okay, there's a question. Do you think there's any way to move back the revision to uh, by a day or two? Um, yeah, so if you um, if you need an extra day or two to submit revision two, go ahead and take an extra day or two. Um, I won't I won't count off for that. So um, it's the due date. I'll leave it as Monday just to encourage you to to get it done. But um, as long as um, I'll I'll check back in with you guys a, a week from today on Thursday, and uh, and we'll see how many people have it turned in. But yeah, go ahead and, and take some extra time if you need it to fill that out. So no problem there. Um, okay, so that's due um, Monday and somewhere between Monday and Thursday. Um, we'll be flexible with that. Um, okay, then you'll have uh, Reflection 8 and Quiz 8. I will post those after class. Um, I was working on getting all of your exams done um, and everything, so I did not get a chance to um, upload those to Canvas, I will do that. Uh, quiz 8 will be simple. Reflection 8 will also be pretty simple. Um, you'll, it'll be um, one of the websites we looked at in the AI uh, machine learning lecture. Um, it was a website that just listed like a bunch of different tools um, for AI and machine learning in HCI. And so the reflection will just be to browse that website, pick one of those tools out, and then write a couple of sentences about it. So I'll post that um, after class. All right, so our semester timeline, um, we are here today. Um, and we will not have class on Tuesday. So um, Tuesday is election day. Um, so I don't think that we should have class. I kind of think it should be a day where we, we try to give people a holiday um, so that they can go vote if they need to do that. I know this year is crazy and that, you know, um, we're not all voting in person necessarily, and I know that a lot of us um, here, you know, we don't vote here um, if we're not residents here. But um, nevertheless, if you are a registered voter here um, and you haven't voted, um, try to, uh, to be sure to go vote on Tuesday. So we won't meet for lecture. Um, I will be around for office hours um, if you need anything. Um, and so after uh, our meeting today, we will our next meeting will be in a week. It will be on the 5th of November. Um, so just keep that in mind. And you can also use this time uh, to work on your projects if, 
if you um, don't need it for voting. So um, let's take a look um, at, um, we were talking about cybersecurity and HCI and we'd almost finished that up. So let's go ahead and complete that today and then we'll talk a little bit about um, HCI and elections. So um, if you remember, we said that security and privacy are very closely related. Um, so when we think about security and we think about privacy, those uh, concepts kind of transfer um, across to each other. Um, we looked at this kind of basic um, table that describes kind of security goals, uh, usability HCI goals, and then what usable security looks like where we merge those goals together. Um, we also um, emphasize the importance of mental models um, and how important those are um, when we start to think about security and privacy um, and the idea that um, the best security and privacy designs will try to give the user a mental model of how security works um, and how they're part of that as they interact with the system. And that's not an easy thing to do. So that's, that's kind of where the, the main challenge is. Um, and so we talked about, you know, how do we think about those things? Um, then we talked a little bit about passwords specifically, which is a, an area of research that's, you know, gone on for a long time, looking at, um, you know, how do we generate passwords that are secure, but are also things that people can remember and keep up with. Um, that battle continues. Um, then we talked just a little bit about um, passive security indicators and phishing. Ah, a okay, question. Oh, yes, yes, okay, so, um, yeah. Um, oh, Hassan, I, I got, yeah, I got your email. So, um, yeah, I'll definitely take care of that. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, so, passive security uh, indicators. Um, so, we talked about things like these URL bars, these secure icons that we see, and we see them, you know, change over um, time and, you know, are they helpful to users? What do they mean to users? Um, and we talked about users wanting the path of least resistance and not always, you know, um, really understanding what these mean or making good use of these. And so then we focused in on warnings and how do we decide when to warn a user about something. Um, and so we, we really looked at this idea of when we are pretty sure there's danger, we should just block it automatically. We should protect the user. Um, when we are pretty sure there isn't danger, we shouldn't bother the user. And then we talked about this middle ground being the real, um, the real area of study where we really have to make design decisions so that we don't you know, hit a user with too many warnings such that they just ignore them, um, which is pretty common, and that we inform them in a way that they understand um, what's going on and are able to assess the threat. And so that put us here um, in the area of security or privacy policies. Um, so let's, let's pick up here um, and talk about um, the idea of privacy policies and, and what their purpose is and, and how do we design these. So this image over here on the right um, is um, from an effort um, several years ago to standardize privacy policies to make them more understandable for users. And the idea here um, was mostly that we would try to make um, these privacy policies um, into something that a machine could parse and that we could visualize easily and that you know perhaps would be standard that users could understand. Um, for the most part, this effort has has been a bad idea. Uh, as you can see just, just from this, this is not um, exactly consumable and easily understood. Um, so we're kind of left with this problem um, where historically most users don't read privacy policies. Um, if they do read them, they don't understand what they mean. Um, historically, privacy policies have been written, you know, uh, mostly by people um, from the legal side of things, um, in language that's not easily understood, um, and they're, they're really not usable in the sense of, you know, 
you give them to a user and you know they need to understand this thing um, and that's not been the case um, so one of the big questions is you know how can we make this uh, more understandable and more usable to the user because what's really important is that if they're going to actually control their privacy and understand their privacy um, they've got to understand the policy uh, and how it operates in the system so we can talk about um, these kind of six components here um, and these are six components of um, what we would call an informed consent uh, kind of privacy policy approach um, and you you might be familiar with informed consent um, It's something that we do like when we bring people in to uh, participate in research studies right we talked about that we give them you know some paperwork and we tell them you know what they're going to do what the risk might be um, what uh, what the benefits are and then they have an option um, to participate and so the big thing is to get them to understand all of those things um, in a reasonable way and so this approach to making privacy policies and and conveying privacy um, information to users uh, is, is kind of similar. So we look at these six components, um, the first one being disclosure. So of course you want to tell the user you know what exactly is going to be shared and how it's going to be shared. Um, we need to make an effort to make sure the user understands um, the disclosure, um, what what we're going to do with things. Um, they need to have an option uh, to, you know, agree to this use of data or this policy of how their data will be handled or shared. Um, and we don't, uh, we should not coerce or manipulate them into agreeing to this um, policy. Um, and then we also have the issue of uh, users need to be able to actually give consent. Um, and so this, this varies um, kind of depending on where you are um, as to you know, what do we consider um, in terms of can someone actually, are they competent to give consent to this kind of thing. So in the United States, for example, um, you know, children um, 12 and under, they cannot uh, give that consent. Um, and so if you've ever heard of the COPPA um, Act, um, COPPA legislation um, that protects children online, um, that's, that's part of that. Um, but we also have to think about other um, users who might have impairments that would prevent them from understanding the consent that they might be giving, so that's important. Um, kind of the fifth thing here is agreement. Obviously, uh, the user has to be given the choice to agree to this. Um, and kind of the more important part about this is that we would ideally like this agreement to be ongoing, right? So there's this problem where users um, are quick to just click through and agree to something um, to get their short-term goal done and forget about it. Um, and there's also um, the common theme of a lot of the systems that we use and deploy um, for users, we update, we change. Um, you know, uh, we do new things, we collect new data, we analyze it in different ways. So we have to keep users informed and we have to continuously give them a way to agree um, to this um, privacy policy that we're, that we're uh, proposing. And then um, the final point here is that we really don't want to overwhelm users um, with the consent process. Um, so this is again where those traditional uh, privacy policies that are usually you know, written by um, people focused on legal aspects are, they tend to be lengthy. Um, you know, if you ever install software and you see the nice terms of service and we all just click I agree and move on with our lives because you can't actually read it. Um, it would, you know, take forever. Um, and do you want the software or not? Um, so you can kind of think of those everyday experiences and, and think about how they work with this. Um, so we would ideally like this to be something that's conveyed in a way that's not overwhelming. Um, and we can think of some things where maybe this isn't so clear. Um, if you use Gmail, for example, um, you know, would you say 
that most users feel they've given informed consent to receive targeted ads in Gmail? Probably not. Um, so Gmail uh, you know, uses algorithms to scan the content of your email, and it uses that to decide how it should advertise to you. Um, there are a lot of protections in place and a lot of um, engineering and thought that goes into that. Um, but um, as far as I know, it's, it's not something that's front and center uh, presented to someone when they register. Um, and it's, it's not apparent to them. Um, so that's something to think about. And you can think about a lot of other services that you use day to day um, and, and how they convey um, information about the privacy of the data they collect um, and process. Um, so kind of the final two points is that, you know, to actually have usable privacy, you need this informed consent. Um, and you really need users to understand what's going on with their data. So next, let's talk about um, access controls. Okay, So a lot of services that we use, a lot of software that we build, um, has a lot of sharing features, right? Um, there are a lot of things we want to do where we want to um, share access to you know, the data we're producing or, or whatever the resource is um, with others, right? Um, and this can be problematic um, if it's not designed in a way that users understand um, what's going on. Um, so kind of the first key point here is that we need to make access controls visible. Um, and ideally, we need them to be part of the typical workflow that a user engages in. Um, a lot of workflows kind of keep this part as secondary. Um, they're just kind of off to the side. Um, in addition to making these visible um, and, and easily um, accessed, we need them to be um, simplified in a sense that the majority of users on our platform can understand what they mean, um, and that we don't um, overcomplicate uh, the controls. So um, some examples of this is when we start to talk about policies, um, like access control policies. So if you think about operating systems, for example, like um, Windows permissions just on files and folders, um, what happens is you can actually have quite a few complex policies, right? Because you can have users who are members of certain groups, and this group may have these write permissions, but not read permission, or you know, kind of uh, pick and choose what permissions they have. And then you know, perhaps a user is a member of multiple groups. So what happens if they're a member of one group that has a deny permission and one that has an allow? How does that play out? Um, it's not always incredibly clear. Um, especially to the end user, and and a lot of times to the uh, users who are you know um, administrators of these systems, who are enforcing these permissions and building these groups and managing them. Um, so there's been a lot of work um, in HCI looking at how to make um, meaningful visualizations of these policies um, that allow a user um, or an administrator to understand how these policies are being applied. Um, another important point when we do look at um, access controls is that we want to follow common conventions and norms. Um, we shouldn't do anything that's um, unexpected. Um, so, you know, kind of a simple example, it would be unexpected for us just to, by default, you know, make everything public um, in a lot of cases. That, that would be something um, that perhaps wouldn't um, wouldn't be expected by the user and might might actually mislead them. Um, they wouldn't realize that you know the access is not controlled in the way that they think. Um, what we also want to do is if we can't, um, in a lot of cases, we can't really force users to engage with access controls on a regular basis. That's typically not what they're sitting down to do. Um, if we can't do that, kind of a popular thing that's uh, been happening 
in the past few years is to do these regular reviews um, of access controls and privacy controls. Um, so Google does uh, periodic privacy security checkups. Um, they will send you an email and ask you to complete the security and privacy checkup. Um, they claim that they've had pretty good results with this. Um, and it's kind of a, a system that walks you through, um, you know, because Google has so many products, um, it walks you through kind of the privacy and security aspects of everything that you're using um, and, and allows you to assess that um, and, and make sure that you're aware of what's going on. Um, and you also want to remind users when they're sharing something sensitive. So um, over here on the right, this is an email um, that I got just you know just a few days ago. Um, Google sends these to me, I think probably monthly, um, to remind me that I'm sharing my uh, real-time location um, with someone. Um, in this case, with my wife. Um, but so you know, it's a uh, it's a nice reminder. Um, if you were to set a, a permission or um, if someone else were to um, add themselves to you know, the list of being able to obtain your real-time location, you were unaware of it, um, if you didn't have something like this or, and you didn't have these checkups, you might not ever realize that that data is being shared. Um, and so you start to see things like this um, incorporated into the user experience um, in a lot of uh, a lot of platforms that are, are commonly used by people um, that allow sharing. Um, another thing to keep in mind, and this is more of a you know, security-based principle, um, but is is really important in terms of maintaining security um, and privacy, is that we always want to grant the least privileges necessary. Um, so an example of this um, is for a long time um, on um, Apple's iPhone, so on iOS, um, iPhones or iPads. Um, if you wanted to um, use a, like a photo, if you wanted to like you download some third-party app, right, and it's, it's going to maybe you know, um, put filters on a photo or let you edit a photo or do something with a photo, um, for a while, um, kind of the default way for um, third-party applications to do that, the, the only option they had was to request um, full access to all of the photos on your device. Um, and this is problematic because, you know, I might be okay um, letting a particular app um, have, you know, a certain photo that I want it to use, right? Um, but in a lot of cases, I'm not okay um, with that app having you know, unrestricted access to my entire um, photo album, which for a lot of users spans years and years and years um, you know, of, of their, all of their photos. Um, and a lot of these photos have lots of nice rich metadata, you know, including location data. Um, and so that becomes an issue. Um, so that's changed, um, in, at least in um, Apple's case, um, in the past couple of iterations of iOS. Um, they've really um, kind of forced developers over to a different paradigm that um, where they don't um, get kind of full access um, by default, and where um, the default is to bring up an image picker, which then will only pass on you know the images or the album that you want to grant them access to. Um, in some cases, that can be um, problematic for the user experience. Um, it's one more thing that a user does have to worry about. But I think um, we do see that the potential for abuse, um, and I'm not sure of any actual abuse that's ever happened with this. Um, I'm, I'm certain it has, but um, the potential is great enough that. You know, it made sense um, to kind of design around that and design those protections in at a fundamental level. Um, related to that is, a, is another important point um, of when you need um, access to something, um, 
it's better to ask the user at the time of use when you need it instead of upfront. So if you think about, you install an app, um, and maybe it's got features that use your location. Okay, so maybe it's got some features that you share your location, and that provides you helpful data, and that's great. But maybe a lot of the other features don't need location data. Um, if you ask the user up front, you know, as soon as they install the app, um, you say, "Oh, um, can I have location access to do this?" You know, whatever. Um, then they're going to grant that early on, and they may not remember why. Um, and so, what's better to do is to not not initiate that prompt until you actually need to use location data for the first time. And we've seen this evolve as well. So initially, um, we saw some pretty um, you know, binary choices in terms of um, on mobile devices installing applications and giving them like location access permission. Um, it was kind of a like yes, no. Do they get it or do they not get it? Um, now we see a lot of um, systems have, have moved to a, a paradigm where you can specify, you know, um, only allow this application to see my location when I'm actually using it. Um, or, and you know, if it's an app that does need your location all the time and you're okay with that, well then you can you can approve that as well. Um, and we also see um, kind of this third point here about reminding users about the permissions that have been granted. Um, we see on a lot of um, operating systems um, regular reminders to users that, you know, hey, this app is using your location in the background. Um, is that still okay? And, and that can help um, if, if the user no longer wants the app to do that um, or if they were unaware altogether. Um, and that's also um, important um, I mean, if you think about designing that system. Um, if you were to design that, when, when should we remind users? Um, you would probably want to look at um, like, oh, has the user granted you know access uh, to location data in the background for this app, and they haven't used the app in like four months, but it keeps using location data? Um, that's probably one you would want to prompt about. Um, so there's design considerations there. Um, kind of in a similar way, um, you want when you ask users about um, permissions and access controls, you don't really want to like hit them with a long list of them at the beginning. Um, you, it is a little bit better to do that as those permissions are needed um, and not all at once because the users do have a tendency to just push through notifications to get to their short-term goals. Um, so that's something to think about as well. Um, another big point is to provide understandable descriptions to users, you know, um, and I think a lot of um, like the Android um, or Google Play Store and um, the Apple's App Store have really um, cracked down on, on regulating this and making sure that people who make apps who are asking for different uh, permissions um, provide uh, understandable reasons. Um, to the user as to what they're going to do with that permission. Um, and then kind of the last point here is that a lot of times you need to help users understand what the choices mean in terms of privacy and security. So uh, one example of this that's um, pretty common is, you know, um, Facebook. There are a lot of um, privacy and security controls available on Facebook. Um, a lot of granular controls that are offered for who can see what and who can do what um, with regards to like your profile, your account. Um, and Facebook has a feature that allows you to view your profile as someone else. Um, and that can be helpful because that kind of lets a user validate um, what's going on. Now I should say that feature was exploited um, not that long ago, um, had a security vulnerability um, that actually was pretty bad for Facebook. But the feature itself um, if implemented properly is, is a good thing in terms of privacy and security. So just some general tips um, for privacy and security design. Um, you want to keep the number of decisions a user makes to a minimum. Um, 
choose reasonable and safe defaults. Um, a great example of this is the there's a uh, NoSQL database, uh, MongoDB. It's very popular. Um, that for a long time um, defaulted to um, no password protection, no authentication when you install it, um, which is convenient for developers um, because it, you know they can just start developing their apps and use this database with no problem. Um, the problem is that a lot of these uh, MongoDB installs have been made public, pushed out into production with no security at all because that is the default. Um, and there's still, today, a major source of data leaks are these unsecured MongoDB databases that are out there. Um, it's a little more of a kind of a programming development example, but um, safe defaults are good, even if they add a little bit of friction to the experience. Um, you want to make it hard to um, bypass um, or disable essential protections. And when you do allow this, in some cases, you want to automatically re-enable this, re-enable those protections, um, because the user will often forget to do that. Um, so you make a decision for convenience, but forget to um, put back the protection. Um, we talked about having a careful balance between automation and human decisions. Um, we don't want to harass the user too much. Um, we want to try to make automated decisions when we can. Um, we always want things to be as understandable as possible. Um, and we really want to limit the frequency um, at which we require people to read detailed information. They just don't do it. Um, so a few more tips. Um, so user decisions, uh, always remember that they do have time and purpose. Um, so ask those questions. Um, and the ask for those user decisions um, when they matter, um, not ahead of time. Um, oh, OK, here's a question. Can't individual developers create their own passwords before going into production with MongoDB? Definitely, yes. Um, yeah, MongoDB has got security there. Um, it's just not the default. Um, it may be the default now. Um, they may have finally updated that to where, at the time of installation, it is default. Um, but just kind of what happened is people uh, forgot, I guess, in a lot of cases. Um, and in some other cases, they relied on other protections, like firewalls and other access rules that would prevent um, people you know, on the public internet from getting to their MongoDB instance. But then you know, if those protections um, get disabled or aren't managed by the same team and nobody realizes it, um, then you don't have that level of protection. But yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, question and a great point. Yeah, uh, MongoDB definitely supports the security. It just wasn't the default. Um, and so kind of, a, kind of a, a good story in terms of why defaults are important. Um, so you also don't want, uh, don't want to ask users to make long-lasting decisions um, you know, until they need to. Um, and, and you want to remind them about that. Um, always remember, path of least resistance is the choice for users. Um, and that makes sense. Um, we want to use the technology, the software, the hardware for you know, doing what we want to do, not, not for doing security and privacy. And you know, for a lot of us, that's not at the top of our list. Um, and then, uh, oh, I made this point earlier. I'm just, you know, when you let users turn things off, um, they may forget to restore them. So you may want to help them out there, give them the option to disable it temporarily, um, and really be careful with permanent um, disabling of things. And this, I, I will say, you know, this can get annoying for some of us. Um, so Windows uh, 10 initially really just, you know, was aggressive with not allowing you to disable certain things permanently. Um, even when you, you know, could promise that you were a person who knew what you were doing and had a good reason for it. Um, so this is, this is, of course, a balance um, as well. OK. So that sums up um, kind of privacy and security in HCI. Um, and so those are, those are all important things to think about as you design systems, as you use systems. Um, they're things that matter 
quite a bit uh, today. So uh, for the rest of our lecture today, I wanted to look just a little bit at um, HCI in the US presidential election. Um, so every, every semester that I teach HCI, I try to do um, one, one lecture that's kind of just on a, a topic or something that's going on in the world. Um, so you know, every four years, we get, we get to have these uh, nationwide elections in the US um, for president. Um, so I thought that's, that was a great opportunity to talk just a little bit about some of the HCI involved in this. Um, so I'm going to kind of hit on just a few areas, um, ranging from voter registration, campaigning, um, we'll mention some primaries which occur before the election in the US, um, some of the HCI involved in polling and making predictions about the outcome of elections, and uh, voting itself, that's where we'll spend most of our time, and then reporting results. Um, I won't be talking about these guys, um, and I won't be talking about anything really political um, in terms of, you know, um, the issues or um, kind of what's going on in our election. Um, I really just want to talk about the HCI surrounding that. Um, so, so we won't focus on you know any particular party or issue or anything like that. Um, you, you hear plenty of that everywhere else today. Um, so I just want to look at uh, where technology comes into this. Where does uh, HCI meet with this? And um, we, so we had a reflection post um, earlier this week about this. And I uh, read all of your reflection posts. And you, you guys did a great job. Um, and, and really uh, found a lot of, a lot of interesting things um, in terms of uh, different aspects of, um, of kind of this election process and, and the technology involved with it. Um, so I'll just start um, with voter registration, um, and just to to kind of give us a, just a, some basics. Um, so in the U.S., um, kind of everything is um, structured in um, this hierarchy of local um, jurisdictions. So like a county, for example, or um, a parish in some states, um, within a state. Um, and then um, states making up the full country, right? Um, so voter registration um, in the United States uh, is typically done at a state level. Um, and the, the actual registration process, you know, is handled um, by those subdivided areas in the United States. Um, but um, the states themselves keep a, um, a role and a database of uh, people who are registered to vote. Um, and so there are some requirement requirements that we have um, to be able to register to vote. Um, they change a little bit every now and then, um, but but not, not too often. Um, so there is a registration step. Um, one of the, um, so one of the big things about, about elections in the US um, is that you do need to be registered to start this voting process. Um, and so that's that's a huge part of um, if you're if you're someone who's running for office, right? Um, you definitely want to uh, encourage people to be registered to vote so that they can actually vote. Um, so kind of the first you know piece of HCI that we see here is we see a lot of um, interfaces that typically are websites today. Um, some of them are mobile apps um, that that focus on helping people register to vote. Um, here's vote.org is one um, where you can kind of give your information um, and it will guide you through the process of registering to vote wherever it is that, that you live. Um, and this varies greatly by state um, as to how you can register to vote. Um, and so these voter rolls of, of all the eligible voters are maintained at local levels. Um, so here's another example of a um, website. Um, this is a government website, so I think this is vote.gov, um, that helps you kind of solve this, this same uh, problem um, about you know, how do I get registered to vote? How do I check if I'm registered to vote? Um, and one of the big challenges here is that because there are um, you know, 50 states um, in the United States, all with their own ideas about how to do this, um, we have to have systems that keep up with um, all of the details of all of these states and how this works. Um, and you know, 
that that is a task in itself, and um, so it's, it's definitely um, an effort to make user-friendly ways to do this. Um, and a lot of it is more of an engineering effort in terms of connecting these systems together uh, to make them useful. Um, here's an example for, uh, from Alabama. So um, this is an electronic uh, voter registration application. Um, so some states um, will allow you to um, register um, electronically, very convenient. Other states um, still require you to you know, show up in person um, and submit paperwork um, to to register to vote um, in those states. So, um, I want to briefly mention uh, campaigning. I didn't want to get um, too much into campaigning. Um, so, uh, kind of, we have started to see the use of a lot of um, technology and specifically social media um, being used by campaigns um, since um, I would say 2008 probably um, the election where uh, Barack Obama was uh, elected for his first term. Um, we certainly saw um, kind of technology platforms uh, being leveraged quite a bit by campaigns um, and that can that can really range um, across a lot of things. Um, so we today we see a lot of social media use um, by campaigns um, in terms of connecting with voters, trying to advertise to the right voters, um, and trying to assess you know, um, what they need to do, where they need to put their money, where they need to put their resources. Um, but what we also um, might think about in terms of campaigning is that the campaigns themselves um, use a lot of custom software, um, a lot of um, mobile apps um, to do things um, all the way from you know communications within the campaigns, um, communications within political parties. Um, so in the United States, there are two major political parties, Republicans and Democrats, and um, they, you know, you will have people in that party running for all these different offices, and there is some coordination um, across that that organization or those organizations. Um, so we see um, custom solutions being developed for that, um, and we see even um, apps uh, meant for for voters. Um, so the major campaigns do have apps that try to keep um, their voters engaged um, to remind them, um, you know when they should vote, where they can vote, um, and in a lot of cases um, to fundraise money for the campaign um, and also to promote um, campaign events. That's not that popular um, you know, this year um, because of uh, the pandemic and kind of limiting those things, um, but it's certainly, certainly a big thing um, in terms of um, connecting with voters. Um, and we also see a lot of um, persuasive computing techniques, a lot of um, techniques used to keep people engaged, uh, gamification techniques um, used in those apps. Um, we won't look at those in detail because that's its, its whole own thing. Um, but I do want to acknowledge they exist. Um, in terms of primaries, I want to I touch on um, kind of a recent um, event that occurred, um, and th maybe not that recent because um, time is just very messed up right now. Um, but this wasn't that long ago. Um, so uh, in, um, at the beginning of the year, 2020, um, we had um, the uh, Iowa caucuses, the, the Democratic um, caucuses, which is you know, an event where um, you've got all of these hopeful candidates that want to be the, the party's nominee for, as to be the presidential candidate. Um, so, so since then, um, Joe Biden was nominated as, as the uh, Democratic Party's candidate for president, um, and uh, Donald Trump is the Republicans' you know candidate um, because the the incumbent um, you know presidents can serve two terms. Um, so generally, the you know after they've served one term, they do run again for re-election. Um, so that's not as much of a mystery. So in in 2020, it was you know um, the the Democratic Party that we were really interested in in choosing a candidate. Um, and one of the big uh, problems that happened was that in the Iowa caucuses, which are pretty important um, in terms of choosing someone um, for, um, to be the candidate, and um, 
So if you're not familiar, these uh, every state will kind of have this primary voting uh, that occurs um, to help choose the candidate for the party. Um, and so um, the Iowa caucuses were using this app um, to report the results um, ac from across the state um, to their central headquarters um, to, you know, to see who won their, um, their primary, uh, their event. Um, you know, and so um, as they do these across all of the states, um, you know, whoever gets a, meets a certain threshold, that, that typically becomes the candidate. Um, for that party, um, the, there are a lot of details, but um, in general, that's how it works. Um, and we actually had for the for the first time in in a while um, uh, the inability to say who won um, this um, you know this caucus this this uh, voting that went on across the state because this application suffered from some problems, um, and uh, it took forever to actually find out who the winner was of this. Um, and uh, so you, you saw a lot of articles talking about this specific mobile app that was being used across the state um, to, to tally um, these votes. And it, kind of the main problem with this app, and that you can read a lot of detailed analyses of this, um, there were a lot of usability issues um, in terms of you know um, all of these different sites had to be able to authenticate and log into the app, right? Because you don't want... Um, you don't want it to be insecure, um, but uh, so that was problematic for quite a few of these sites um, because it was a slightly complicated process. But also, what happened is this wasn't tested well enough, and the actual major failure was that once the results were, you know, sent to the centralized database, they had to be merged in with the party's main database um, to actually calculate um, the winner. Or you know to appropriate um, the um, the votes um, across these candidates, um, and that process um, had errors in it in the way that it processed the data. Um, and this was something that could have been uh, easily solved um, if enough testing would have been done. Um, and so this this really caused a lot of problems. There was a lot of outrage about this, um, and. It kind of shows you that this is um, this is an area where these programs uh, this, and software are higher stakes um, than than a lot of the things that we use and design. Um, so let's talk about polling and predictions a little bit. Um, so another big part of elections um, is trying to figure out who's winning um, before we've counted the votes, right? Um, and this is useful for people who are running for office because they need to know where should they campaign, um, you know, and where where are they being effective or ineffective, um, and even what do voters care about, um, you know, things like that. Um, and it's also interesting um, just because we we like to kind of predict what's going to happen, um, you know, as the elections go on. Um, so we see some um, interfaces developed for um, looking at, um, you know, predicting how the election is going to work. Um, this is a simple one from CBS. This is their their tracker. All major news organizations have um, a form of this. Um, they typically have a form they use on television, um, and they have uh, plenty of web versions of it that are accessible and usually interactive. Um, for people who, who want to see kind of what's going on. Um, and there are also a lot of these tools that provide more detailed information um, for people who, who are working in campaigns or in um, elections. Um, so one of my um, favorites um, in terms of uh, just really uh, nice visualizations and interesting um, interactive interfaces um, for uh, polling and predictions for U.S. elections um, is um, 538. Um, so 538.com is the website. Um, they're actually owned by ABC, um, but they kind of function as an independent um, entity for the most part. Um, so they produce a lot of great visuals, um, interactive, um, you know, things that you can um, try different uh, scenarios with on their website. 
um, a lot of great information just about voting and polling and kind of how that works in the United States and what's going on. Um, the whole uh, the whole process and and the way that elections work, at least presidential elections in the United States, is quite complicated. Um, and it, there are a lot of details that matter um, when you start to try to predict things or understand what what the state of the world is. Um, and as a side note, they actually um, they have some pretty some pretty good podcast if you're interested in this kind of thing. Um, I do recommend listening to some of their podcasts. Um, it's interesting. Um, so here's just a couple of, of visualizations that you know you might um, might find interesting. They do all kinds of stuff. Um, showing this is kind of like a, a visualization showing this path to victory, um, and and there are a few different ways to look at it here. Um, a really interesting um, feature that they have is kind of the simulation um, interactive feature that allows you to um, choose perhaps who's winning in each state to see kind of the probability of a, a winner um, overall. Um, so let's see if I can pull up an interactive version of this. Um, so for example, um, you can go here and so you've got all of your states, right? And you can go in um, and choose, um, you know, who of, uh, so this is representing Donald Trump and this is representing Joe Biden. Um, you could say, well, I think, you know, Donald Trump is going to win Texas. Um, maybe Joe Biden's going to win Wisconsin. Um, maybe Donald Trump will win Arizona. Um, oh, Florida, who knows there, uh, right? So these are, and, and these choices that they have are kind of the ones that, you know, people are saying have close margins right now. And as you change this, right, um, so Pennsylvania being a, a very important one that definitely will push things over the edge. I'm just choosing randomly here, by the way. Um, what this is doing is um, running simulations um, as it fills in these states and kind of visualizing this probability of, um, you know what's the likelihood of each of these candidates winning, and so you can you can do just the key states, um, or you can you can actually go through and do all of the states. Um, some states we're really certain about, for example. So, um, for example, New York, um, you don't even have the option here to choose uh, Donald Trump or the Republican Party because New York um, is typically you know um, well as long as I've known about it, um, it goes to the the Democratic candidate. Um, so th those are kind of locked in. But this um, runs simulations and, and kind of shows you this visualization. There are a lot of uh, you know great uh, tools for this, but 538 is one of my favorite. So the question is, who's the winner of, of the forecast so far? Um, so right now, uh, most polls um, would say that it is more likely that Joe Biden will win the presidential election. Um, that is a, a difficult thing to say. And I think uh, most people who do these polls will, would really hesitate to say that's a for sure thing. Um, so if, um, if you remember the 2016 election, um, polling really indicated that um, Hillary Clinton, who was running against Donald Trump, was likely to win. Um, and, and the polling turned out to have uh, to, to not accurately predict the results of the election. Um, and, and that was quite interesting because it led to a lot of analysis about how this polling is done. Um, so I should say that, um, you know, we don't know um, when we do these polls, um, we're just, we're polling people who are likely voters or people um, right after they vote. Um, typically we try to ask people if they'll tell us who they voted for. And we do these surveys and we try to take that data and build a statistical model and, and make predictions based on that. We also, I mean, there are a lot of factors that go into, into this. Um, and so until all the votes are counted, we don't actually know, um, it's a guess, um, but we have a lot of confidence typically um, about these guesses. Um, and so that makes for these, these great interfaces about trying to figure out um, how confident we should be about certain things, um, but it's not um, it's not a for sure thing. And so I should say, um, if anybody's uh, not familiar or, or needs a little refresher about um, kind of you know the way that we um, do 
um, the presidential election in the United States, um, we actually don't. Um, so you, you could think about it as like, oh, well, everybody in the United States is going to vote, right? We'll count up all the votes, and then you know whoever gets the most votes wins. That's not how it works. Um, we use an electoral voting system, so each state um, has a number of electoral votes, um, and states, for the most part, what a state will do is, um, you know, whoever wins a state, like Texas, for instance, whoever wins Texas gets their electoral votes. Um, in some states, they do divide electoral votes. Um, Nebraska is one of them. I believe Maine is one of them. Um, and kind of um, either proportionally give them or, or do it based on regions. Um, but what we do is then, then we add up those electoral votes and um, 270 is the magic number. Um, you need 270 electoral votes um, to be elected president. Um, so that's, and, and that's how we um, elect a president. Um, so it's, um, it's, uh, it's interesting because we've had a few cases uh, in the US of um, the popular vote. So if you count up all the vote and look at who got more, um, the person who wins that not being the winner of the election um, because of the way this works. Um, so that's happened a couple of times um, in, in US history, and that's, it's interesting um, because the system works this way. Um, so a couple of questions. So which tools do they use to make these interfaces? You know, I don't know off the top of my head what 538 uses. Um, I believe they do discuss it, and I think they even have some GitHub um, links to some of their tools. I know a lot of the tools that I've seen, um, or a lot of um, the uh, visualizations, like you know, a lot of newspapers will do them. So the New York Times does one. Um, they typically use some of like the JavaScript libraries because it's all web-based. So like D3 um, is a popular one that I've seen used, um, and a lot of them write their own too. Um, and a lot of them will open source that data. So that's that's kind of nice and kind of cool. Um, so yeah, polling yeah the polling in 2016 really uh, really threw people. Um, pollsters, people who do this, um, kind of kind of had a moment there. Um, and, and so it'll be interesting to see how our election turns out um, this, this year, right? Um, polls kind of, you know, uniformly at the moment indicating it looks like Joe Biden will be the winner. Um, but the, some of the margins are close. Um, and so it's never a sure thing. It's always a probability. Um, and so that's, that's part of developing these, these visualizations. So kind of move on to voting. Um, so I'll talk about two kinds of voting. Kind of the, the voting that is most popular in the United States, um, typically, is in-person voting, where we use these kinds of you know, voting machines um, to cast our, our, boat, our votes. Um, and uh, the, other, the other type of voting that's popular in the US is absentee voting. Um, and so um, absentee voting, there's an, or a number of reasons that you can absentee vote. Um, uh, so, I absentee vote um, somewhat frequently, I guess, in, in you know um, the elections that I've um, been old enough to vote in, um, because I'm um, you know I've been a college student, uh, my undergrad, um, living away from home, and um, you know in my grad studies here I live away from home, um, so. Um, Absentee voting is designed um, to allow people who are away from, from their um, place of residence where they're registered to vote to vote remotely. Um, and it's done um, with a paper ballot through the mail um, in the United States. Um, and there's, there's a process for that. Um, now that's a little more popular um, this election, and it's a little more um, controversial, I should say, this election, um, because of um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, a lot of states have tried to expand access to the absentee voting, um, trying to limit um, the number of people um, having to be in person um, in, in these uh, voting um, locations. Um, and so um, to give you an idea of absentee voting, I thought I'd show you just kind of um, how I voted this, um, this year. Um, so in, I live in Texas, that's where I'm a resident. Um, the way it works in Texas is um, you fill out an application, um, with all of your um, identifying information, you sign that, you put it in an envelope, you send it to um, the, uh, 
county that you're uh, registered to vote in, um, in Texas. And then, um, then they send you back um, a ballot, an absentee ballot. Looks like this, you get it in the mail. And inside of that envelope, it's full of all kinds of things. Um, so in my case, um, this is what the uh, Texas ballot in, um, in my county where I live looks like. Um, there are a lot of uh, different things to vote for, some of them uh, national, so here's the presidential section. Um, and you know, here's uh, senators, um, and then there's a lot of state level things going on. And so um, you get this election, this ballot, you um, fill it out, um, you get lots of instructions about what to do, what not to do, lots of extra bonus material, write-in candidates that you could add. Um, and then you have these two envelopes here with lots of information um, on them. Um, and then you, you seal the ballot in one envelope, put it inside the other envelope, and you mail that back um, to your, your home where you're registered to vote, and the ballot is processed there. Um, I should say, um, state of Texas, um, you have no idea if that ballot is counted or not. So um, I've, you know, I mail it back. Um, you can, I could, I guess I could call um, the county um, where I'm registered to vote to ensure that they received it. But there's no easy way to track, you know, did your did your ballot um, get back apart from apart from calling them and checking on that. Um, so let's talk about uh, in-person voting a little bit, um, kind of the more common common way. And a lot of you looked at different voting machines um, and voting interfaces um, in your reflections, and there are a ton of them. Um, so we have kind of electronic interfaces are the most common today. Um, we do have some paper ballots. Um, those are still interfaces. You've still got to design them, and they're still full of problems. I don't think we have mechanical interfaces so much anymore, um, but those were essentially um, mechanical machines that let you um, um, like pull a lever or you know um, punch a hole through um, you know the thing that you wanted to to vote on. Um, so this is uh, one example of a voting machine um, that's quite large. Um, but you know, a lot of these companies that develop voting machines, um, they do a lot more than just the voting machines. They do all kinds of things, um, things like tabulating votes, um, you know, software for election officials um, to you know count up all of their votes and aggregate them. Um, we see a focus on accessibility, right? So um, if you're developing this voting machine, um, all kinds of people vote. All kinds of people. Um, who uh, might not be able to use a touch screen, um, who might not be able to visually see an interface. They might need to hear an audio version of it. Um, and so we try to accommodate that and think about usability in these designs. Um, here's another company and a lot of their products they offer. Um, here's one that's focused on accessible voting. Um, so uh, really trying to make sure that you know, there are you know, easy ways to understand ballots and that they make sense. Um, here's a collection of those products. Um, here's yet another company. So one thing about um, the United States is that um, kind of everyone is on their own to choose these voting machines. There are you know local regulations and there are recommendations at the national level, but we see a huge variety of these machines and interfaces um, depending on where you are voting at. Um, so that complicates things quite a bit. Um, Ballot tracking, I mentioned I'm not able to track my ballot, but some people are. So this is a, a company that um, lets you um, do some ballot tracking, you know, a tracking number on your ballot. You can see if it's been processed. Here are some of the areas that allow you to do that. Um, a lot of them are not using this system, at least. Um, so I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, some HCI studies on voting um, with, the, with the time we have left. Um, so this is a book, it's a little bit older, from 2007 about voting technology. And it looks at several different voting interfaces that were available at the time, a lot of them still used today. And um, it's got a lot of great insights. So they do expert reviews with uh, you know, HCI experts, um, and they do studies with thousands of people um, trying out these machines um, and, and interfaces. Um, this graph just shows you kind of over time from 1980 up until like 2006 probably here 
what kind of voting has um, been used. So we see that electronic voting has really taken off and optical scan, which is filling out a paper ballot and then sending it through a scanner. Um, so the book um, itself looks at several um, different voting machines, different options, um, several touch screens, um, some that are optical scan, um, some that, um, so they looked at a prototype of um, one that's more of like a capacitive touch, kind of like a tablet interface that allows you to zoom in really carefully. Um, they review this one with this click wheel. This is a horrible voting interface. I've used this one before. Um, I think the first time I ever voted, I used one of these. It's just a horrible idea. Um, and their studies uh, show that. And here's one that's a giant voting interface with the idea of showing the entire ballot all at once um, and kind of lighting up what you choose there, which has its own issues. Um, so in this book, they kind of evaluate each of these systems and look at all of these aspects um, of the systems. I won't get into too much detail. You can glance at these slides if you're interested. But they do uh, usability studies and user experience studies um, with all of these. And looking at things like how long does it take someone to vote? Um, what did they find difficult? What did they understand? What did they not understand? How often do they have to ask for help? Um, they look at the positive and negative comments for each system. So in general, people really like electronic voting systems. Um, I should say we're not talking about security here. That's its whole own thing. In general, though, uh, when they did these uh, studies, users were pretty um, confident in these systems and were not worried about that kind of thing. Um, so here you can see some of the negative comments about these systems, some of the positive comments about each system, um, the types of errors that were made when they did these trials. Um, and so it's just a really thorough evaluation of these different systems. Um, and I kind of want to arrive at just these design tips that, to think about um, if you're designing something for people to vote. Um, Language is important, um, how you write things. You want to minimize uh, working memory load, uh, cognitive load. You want to be consistent. Feedback is hugely important. You want people to know when their vote's been submitted. Um, good error messages. You always want to provide help, and you always want to be accessible. Also, testing is critically important. And I think it's really interesting, because these are just all of the fundamentals that we've learned about HCI, right? They're all here. Um, and I should say, the US has uh, uh, some standards. So NIST um, has voting standards, which are really great. They're working on a new version of them. Um, and um, they're not mandated by law, but um, we do see people try to conform to them. And they work really carefully on everything from font design to contrast um, to being able to see a whole ballot to how do you make sure that somebody doesn't miss a section of a ballot, um, a lot of important things. So as we wrap up, I do want to talk about reporting results. And I want to talk just a little bit about um, uh, some of the news networks and how they, how they report results. Um, so this is CNN's um, kind of claim to fame here. It's called the Magic Wall. It's a multi-touch interface. And years ago, it was pretty cool um, before, before we had that everywhere. Um, so I'll just jump here. Uh, and this is just a, a video. I'll just let play in the background while I talk about it. Um, kind of showing you uh, some of the functionality of this. If you turn on any news network um, over the next uh, week, I would say, you'll see all kinds of this going on. Um, and so it's, a, it's an interactive system. It's multi-touch. It lets, um, in this case, the newscaster you know, uh, zoom into these different areas um, on the map, look at county level data. Um, you know, they can draw and sketch on it. They can do hypotheticals like, you know, indicate that somebody won this one and show what would happen. Um, and this has become a really common thing. And I just I think it's a great example of um, a larger display interface and, um, and, and kind of a nice usable interface. Um, if you're interested in this kind of thing, I would encourage you to look at some of these. I should say there are similar interfaces used a lot for um, weather uh, forecasting. Um, that, that do a lot of these same things. And it's kind of just fascinating to watch how they're designed um, because they have a limited set of users, um, but they have to be you know, a very um, useful um, and have to present things well. And um, you know, these people who are using them have to be able to um, understand them well. Um, 
so kind of the last thing I, I want to mention, I just I was looking at different interfaces and I noticed this one um, says that uh, Fox News is previewing some 3D and virtual tech um, for for election coverage. Um, so I I cannot wait to see that. I'm going to have to, to jump over to that um, when things are going on and see what they've got. In past years, we've seen some really crazy things. We've seen um, all kinds of augmented reality and you know stuff with the newscaster like you know walking across a map and you know charts coming out of the ground. Um, and so that's just some really uh, that's fun HCI, I guess, and just uh, just kind of the fun um, entertainment part of HCI, but also I incorporating real data and real graphics. Um, so that's everything I have today. Um, Hope you kind of enjoyed our whirlwind tour of some of the election technologies um, that are at use. Um, just a reminder, we will not have class on Tuesday. Um, if you haven't voted and you can vote, um, please vote. Um, and um, apart from that, uh, I'd encourage you maybe to check out the, the news. I think it's going to be a, a really crazy time um, to see how this goes. Um, okay. Quick question on revision two. Uh, who will you ask to evaluate? What kind of information there? Uh, age, name? Uh, just rough idea, really. Um, you can just tell me, like, oh, I'm going to ask a few friends. I'm going to ask some family members. Um, you know, my friends are mostly college age. My family members are older, or you know, something like that. Um, just, just a, an idea. Um, nothing too detailed. Um, any other questions? Um, And I will be um, posting the quiz and reflection um, later today. So, OK, well, that's everything I've got. Um, so I won't see you guys for a week. So please have a good next week. Um, and then we will meet again um, a week from today on WebEx. Um, OK, so I'll hang out and answer questions for a second. Um, oh, yeah, everybody have a nice weekend, too. Uh, for the checkpoint, uh, what do we need to have in terms of uh, rubric or study? Are there certain questions you have to ask? Um, I really just kind of want an idea of what you're thinking about at this point. It doesn't have to be really locked down. There's nothing uh, specific I'm requiring. Um, so you can tell me, like, I'm going to ask them, you know, how easy it was to do this task, or I want them to evaluate this feature um, specifically. Um, it, it can be high level like that. Yeah. Oh, can I explain uh, what Reflection 8 and Quiz 8 are about? Yes. So Quiz 8 will be um, just a couple of quick questions about um, AI machine learning that we covered um, in the last lecture. Um, and Reflection 8 will be um, the uh, a website that has a bunch of different uh, AI tools for doing HCI design. And you'll just be visiting one of those tools um, and providing everyone with the link to the one you visited and a little, you know, a couple sentences about, you know, what you liked or didn't like about it. Yeah, no problem.